This episode brought to you by Gray Block Pizza. Gray Block, get that hitter. Short neck, baby. Higher than a mountain. There we go. Set me free. Just don't say goodbye. It's you and me. Enjoy the destination. Nation, nation, nation. Fantasy. On the wall. Yeah. Come on, let's go. It's never too late to come over. Mm-hmm. Time slips away from you and me now. There you go, boy. So don't you wait. So don't you hesitate to come over. It's never too late to come over. Time slips away from you and me now. That's that D, that's that late night text, you know, that you could drop into a lady's text box. Hey, it's never too late to come over. And then she texts back, uh, yeah, it is. Okay. It's 304. It's 304 AM. And mama just, you know, mama just hit, put a chi- you know, hit a chili dog in her throat and she just put some lotion on her arms and neck. So you, you need to shut it down. And contact me during regular human hours. And that's you, that's from about 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. If you're texting women or men outside of those hours, you know you shouldn't be probably. You know, I think that's non-sensual hours. You know, if you start, or, you know, maybe up to about 11 p.m. Or maybe I would say 11 a.m. or 11 p.m. Because you start getting greedy out there 1 a.m. You fishing. I mean, my, one of my old moves is I would, uh, I would just text a blunt. I would open up a, a girl's, you know, text name on my SMS, and then I would just press the space bar one time, and then I would just send that. So it was just like sending a bubble, nothing, no words, anything, and you just blast that bubble out there, and then see if she wants to, you know, catch that thing in her mouth. And so that's a way you could just be fishing, just throwing bubs into the air. You know, you just tossing them, uh, those uh, empty spheres out there and seeing if anybody's biting, seeing if they got any bad little, uh, seeing if they got any bad little, little ladies biting on them, uh, on them hope bubbles, people hoping for somebody to touch their crotch late at night. Isn't it wild how your crotch just becomes this beacon of hope? Isn't that crazy? I mean, for men it does. I don't, I mean, I don't know what women are doing out at these hours. But for a lot of men, your crotch just becomes this beacon of hope at like about, I think maybe 11.40 p.m. Your crotch just starts sending off this sonar signal. Like, you know, it's like a, it's like a dolphin, just like a coochie dolphin, just kind of, you know, just milling around out in the atmosphere looking for looking for some affection, look for somebody to come over and pet it. Because a crotch, think about this, a a crotch is just like a puppy. All a crotch wants somebody to do is just to come rub on it. Think about that. And that really flares up about 11 p.m. And I don't know what that, if that's called, if that's a syndrome or what that's called, but it's undeniable um, that that happens. That's undeniable that that happens. I want to say happy Memorial Day um, to anyone and everyone who's involved with our armed forces. I want to say, uh, you know, offer a prayer up uh, for anyone who's lost a family member um, in, in, um, in, in service to this country. You know, Memorial Day or Decoration Day, that's what they called, used to call it, 
or some people still call it, they started up after the Civil War, uh, just honoring those who have fallen. And it's a, bra- you know, it's just the bravery there for me. Uh, it's just, I've said this before, one of my biggest regrets is that I haven't served. You know, I've done some, gotten to do some tours uh, for the military over the years and going over and seeing what these men and women's lives are like. And, uh, and it's just fascinating. It's fascinating to know. Sure, it's a job. You know, sure, there's, uh, you know, people are paid for it, but it's, um, it's a brave, it's a bravery that I don't possess. You know, it's a commitment that I, you know, wasn't willing to make. And, you know, my hat's off and my heart open uh, to those who have uh, lost a loved one um, who was in service to our country. Um, and God bless those, uh, those people. You know, that's, uh, that's so brave. I was just at home this weekend. Actually, I went to a high school reunion, and we had a, a gentleman from our class who, who, who lost his life in Afghanistan. And, uh, and it was just interesting hearing people talk about him and share stories. And, um, you know, so I'll be thinking about him uh, this weekend. And I'll be over probably at the cemetery tomorrow. They have a, a beautiful cemetery near me. Uh, I think it's Los Angeles Memorial. What is that? And I go over there on uh, Memorial Day and check it out. And they do some beautiful services. And there's just all the flags on the grave headstones. And it's a it's a pretty marvelous time. Uh, before we get into today's episode, you know, a lot of people have been asking me, what about Trick Long Mickey? You know, he got them new hitters. He got them new baby bags in his chest. You know, and if you don't know about Mickey, uh, Mickey got involved early with the show and we communicated with him and he's been suffering uh, from cystic fibrosis since he was which sounds like a f- which sounds like a snack let's be honest that sounds like something you would get at a health food store you know like oh uh janet just got a new uh, a new bag of uh, cystic fibrosis and we'll be like well i guess it's movie night at her house okay but it's a lung disorder and it's an ailment and it can it can kill you, and uh, and so Mickey's been on this transplant list for a while, and he finally got them new baby bags. And so I want to check in with that. Uh, I want to check in with him right now, and 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 just give you guys an update via him. This is the first time I've talked to him uh, since he got out of his transplant and got those new um, those new hitters that he got. Let's check in with Mickey now. Let's see what's going on. See how them new. Uh, the new air titties are holding out. Hello? Hey, Mickey. Yo, Theo, how's it going, man? What up, bro? Dude, new hitters, bro! You got them new fresh air duffels, huh, baby boy? Man, God dang, man. Life is so good, brother. It's so good to hear your voice, man. Dude, you too, man. You sound like a... Da- Honestly, do you sound like an adult now? <laughs> dude, you know what's crazy? Here's the real fast, dude. My diaphragm hasn't hooked up to my lungs so I got a laugh right now. Mm-hmm. Like, literally, I'm, it's a silent laugh. But I am an adult. I'm an adult now, man. I weigh... uh Dude, I weigh 118 pounds, but I'm still an adult. Dang, you coming? He's that light. <laughs> he's that light adult. But look out! You know, look out! You got some weight to put on. So you don't. Your diaphragm isn't hooked into your new lungs yet. It's, it takes a little bit of strengthening, man. Like literal actual conditioning because those uh, those nerve endings, you know, got severed. Wow. Um, and so that's why, yeah, man. It's why nothing really comes. I'm laughing over here. I really am. Sure. But, um, <laughs> Trick but long Mickey with those at. with those severed nerves, man. So you got that <laughs> you coming in with that soft chuckle right now because you can't, <laughs> dude. You can't really That's go right. you can't really go hard in the humor paint yet, can you? No, man. Well, you know, writing, of course, as we talked about. But uh, amen. Yeah, man. Yeah, uh, it's been good. The laugh will come back. It'll come back. There you go, man. Yeah, and it's going to be such a gift when it does, dude. So I, I mean, you're back. Like you are. Where were you at er, before, like out of ten, and where are you at now out of ten? <laughs> so it's it's really funny, man. You know, when we talked what, like three weeks ago, I want to say four weeks, maybe. Um, you know, I was like, I think I told you, like a, maybe an eight point five in life, right? Yeah, eight out of ten. Yeah, dude, this is like, you know, not to be all hokey or whatever, man. Yeah, it's it's like a it's ten out of ten, if not fifteen Dang, out of ten, man. This, dude. Every day is, oh, man. 
You're out there, every huh? Day, every day is beautiful, dude. So, dude, let me hear. So, you got those new lungs. Now, the person that um that donated them to you, this t- that person was a they overdosed. Is that right? That's true, man. Yeah, I, I said that over text, dude. Uh, in the sense that this was what was considered a high risk transplant, mm-hmm. meaning that the uh, donor had been using intravenous drugs and also spent a little bit of time in jail. Uh, Ooh, boy, you got a real G inside of you now. <laughs> Dude, I, my street credibility went up about 100%, at, at least double what I normally had, you know? Dude, you got them dirty, moist, you got them dirty, moist duffels living in your in your sternum now, dude. This is That's gangster. That's right, man. Um, do, hey, man. Now, is there any... Real, go on. I wanted, I wanted to tell you real fast, it was right after Cinco de Mayo, too, so, mm-hmm. you know, those parties happen, man, and, you know, I, I think I got, you know, what you've told me. Now, I got, I think, I'm going to reach out to the family in, a, like, about nine months or so. Mm-hmm. It's it's fresh for him, right? But what I'm saying is, I think I got a little bit of, uh, you know, I got a little bit of some flavor and salsa in me these days, man. Oh, really? You feel like you could dance better? <laughs> Absolutely, of course. I could breathe better. You definitely know I could be dancing better. Wow, man! I can't believe that. Can you whistle? Give me a whistle, man. What is hey. that? Hey, no, let's wow. do that. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah dude. I, I blew out a kid's birthday candle the other day just because Get the I saw fuck it. out of here, son. We shutting down all these birthday cakes, boy. <laughs> Trick Lung got That's them good. hot bags. Dude, yeah, give man. me that cat call. Can you give me a little bit of cat? Oh, call? hey. He's like, hey, baby girl. That's well, right, man. Oh, damn, bro. Whoa. We're in there, man. We are in bro, here. Bro, you're going to fuck a cousin if you keep, if you, you got to, you got to, you need to tone that back, baby. What about a yodel? Can you give me a yodel? Let me... Oh, dude, yodel, that's going to be too hard, man. We're still singing right now. I'm still singing a little bit of Aliyah, Aliyah first to, to get my yodeling back up, you know? Dude, that's so awesome, man. So you're back. Do you feel, how do you feel? Right now, man, I, oh, I I feel incredible at all levels. I'm I'm so focused on my recovery in regards to my nutrition and mm-hmm. my my sleep and also exercise. Man, I'm exercising like four times a day. I told you I weigh 118. It's because of the fact that the transplant surgery takes a lot of your muscle out of you, man. A lot of that protein to recover. Well, they thieves too. A lot of these doctors, man, they get inside of you. They'll, <laughs> you dude, I'm not, I'm not joking. They're just like, uh, it's like whenever you're building a, a home in a, in a sketchy neighborhood, you have a lot of addicts will sneak in at night and, and bust out the copper piping at night and melt it down and sell it. So you I'm never saying. know what happened, man. You, I woke up. Here's, listen, dude, feel, man. I, I'm, a, I'm a clean gentleman, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I went, I went there prepared and I shaved. And I, I, you know, I, I can't clean. Yeah. And I woke up, I realized these guys also shave my armpits. And I was like, oh, dang, that's the one thing I forgot. Wow. But really? yeah, man, so you never know when you're on that table. You're right, man. Who knows what they're going to do? God dang, you know? Bruh, you could, they could do anything, man. <laughs> I might go in for a, uh, I might go in for a treatment just because I got a lot of body hair. I would, honestly would not even mind, ha- you know, having somebody put me to sleep and take it off of me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But man, I'm so happy for you, dude, and I'm so uh, I'm just so grateful that you let us be a part of, of a little bit of this experience, dude. Dude, I, I if I can gush out to you in in the this past weekend, family, man, I felt God, man, I I thank you so much for being a part of it. I'm happy to be a part of it of, of everything as well. But the the amount of people that have reached out to me, man, I just thank them, thank you, man, and it's yeah. been a truly it's been a truly beautiful experience. I. I I say that with the utmost, utmost truth, man. Well, same here, man. I mean, there's been moments where like, you know, probably little moments in a lot of our days, you know, myself and, and the listeners were, you know, something we didn't want to do or something we didn't want to, you know, take a moment of, or, uh, you know, we didn't want to try and, you know, and then having, you know, some inspiration, having that, you know, you having an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other, but then you got a trick lung Mickey hanging off your ear lobe. <laughs> And you know, sometimes we hear your voice and it tells us to get it going. So, dude, Man. thank you so much. We're going to have to get you in studio sometime this year. Dude, I would love nothing more, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll be in touch, man, and get that recovery process in order. And, you know, I'll be putting out my stuff. And Dude, you yeah, better man. start singing, bro. I want to see you in a choir. I want to see you <laughs> scuba diving. Dude, I want to see you. If somebody can't, like, uh, CPR, dude, you should be giving CPR to people who don't even need it. <laughs> 
Um, it's funny you mentioned on my birthday, I want to go skydiving. You know, I think you just, you just did something like that, right? And, uh, I did, man. Uh, and it was a blast. It and was... now I get to do that. Yeah. So, you know, this, uh, this summer after I recover a little bit, we're going skydiving. So you'll see me out there, man. Oh, I'll look up there and see. I'll, I'll look for you, dude. Um, well, look, thank you so much, dude. Congratulations, you know, just moving on with this battle with cystic fibrosis. And you got them new lungs, dude. And you just get out there and keep taking hits off the world, bro. New hitters, get in there. Get in there. All right, Mick, I'll talk to you soon, man. All right, man. Much luck to you. Catch you later, man. Back at you, bud. Man, and that's one of our mascots right there, Mickey. You know, and that's just so inspiring. And, you know, I met Mickey because, you know, my sister was born with um, biliary atresia. She, she was, when she was born, she had a rare liver disease that affects like, I think almost one and a half million children at the time. And so throughout my childhood, she was, you know, having to be shipped around to these different hospitals and um, she would come home and be all, you know, scarred up. And, you know, she was like this green or she had like a green tint or jaundice kind of, or, a, you know, purple even sometimes. Um, really Mardi Gras colors, honestly. Uh, in Louisiana, you know, even if it's a sick baby, people get excited. If you have uh, green, purple, and gold, they'll be like, well, look, she's sick, but you know, that's uh, Mardi Gras colors. Um, but I remember that. And it just, and then whenever we started getting in touch with Mickey, it just really you know, it's stuck in a special place with me because I, I didn't get to see my sister a lot when we were growing up um, because, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's amazing what illness does. You know, it's just amazing what an infection it is and how it can resonate throughout a family and um, it can bring people together and, and it can take people apart. Um, and I guess that's just all facets of life, you know. I, I didn't mean to get off on a weird tangent already, um, but... <sighs> Oh, the, this whole existence is a weird tangent, isn't it? Isn't this a weird tangent that we are on? Uh, thank you guys for being here with me today. Uh, happy Memorial Day. You know, I went home for my high school graduation. And I wasn't sure up until really the last minute if I was going to go. And I was like, I don't know. Should I? Should I not? And And part of me didn't want to go because... I was like, you know, I, I got offered to do a show on Saturday night with with Joey Diaz and with Joe Rogan at the Ice House in Pasadena, and I was like, and I was like, man, this is a, this is a great opportunity. It's a fun show, you know. I love both these guys. I'm always honored to be around them. And then I was just like, you know, but if I don't go to this reunion, am I going to regret it? And I also didn't want to. You know, I wanted to just stay in touch with kind of, you know, where I where I'm from, I guess, somewhat. I didn't want to I didn't want to I don't know. I wanted to maybe look, see some people's eyes that I hadn't seen in a long time. And maybe a memory would spark up inside. I mean, you know, I wanted, you know, to take a couple puffs off that nostalgia because I'll smoke a freaking boy. I'll smoke a whole rock of nostalgia. I, you know, I love nostalgia. I love taking this free time warp, you know, into a moment. You know, it, it, it's crazy sometimes how, it, you know, you can see somebody or smell something and suddenly you're in a, you're in 15 years earlier in your life. And, you know, people say, well, we don't know if we can time travel. I say, well, then, you know, you didn't walk into a cafeteria and smell some green beans that took me back to my, to my neighbor's house. Because I fucking one hit off those uh those Harry Covers, and that's French for green beans, and fuck, I'm time traveling. But I, I guess I yeah, I didn't want to have that. I didn't want to miss the opportunities of that, of that nostalgia. And then also, I figured, you know, if I go, if I show up at the reunion, you know, maybe somebody else is excited to see me. And so, you know, in the end, I you know I went and I had a nice time. And they had all types of people there. They had one dude, this fella makes prosthetics. And he showed up. So that made me realize, look, if he can do it, I, I'm glad I did it. Because this dude was probably sitting in a dungeon somewhere, you know, car, you know, cauterizing a plastic elbow. You know, or putting some, you know, putting some moles on an ankle. And he left that to come here and just see some old classmates. I mean, can you imagine that just being up all night, just just hammering out a mahogany knee? 
you know, just chipping, chipping a clavicle out of a piece of oak. Can you imagine that? <clears throat> so I'm glad, and I didn't know he did that. And he's tall too. This guy's really tall. So he probably, you know, he has to bend down probably to chip away at some of these things or however they do it. And this guy's making prosthetics. And so it made me think, man, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm glad I came. They had a fellow, new. this guy was recently um, homoerotic. And he hadn't been homoerotic when we saw him in high school. So suddenly he's out there. You know, and he got that neck on a swivel. Lurking, bruh. You know what I'm saying? He's smelling, you know, he smelled a little bit of Old Spice in the distance. You know, and it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch, Oh, the, you know, somebody be newly gay. And you're like, uh-oh. Hope none of these, uh, hope none of these former football high school football players have too many cocktails at this thing, because they're gonna be suddenly they're gonna be uh, they all somebody's gonna be uh, a wide receiver even if they play defense, because we got a new hitter out here in the game. They had a new gentleman out here, and then you see all types of people. You know, they had a girl in our class who had, she'd lost a ton of weight. And, you know, you could just see how inspired she felt and just and how inspired I was inspired seeing her. I was like, wow, you know, the commitment that that, you know, the commitment it takes to change because we just get com we get used to things. We get comfortable in our ways. Um, so, yeah, there was just a lot of it was just interesting, you know, seeing people that were more just more outgoing now. You know, you see an old girl that you never asked out, and then there she is. You know, there was a girl that I never asked out when I was in school. And I always, I think, had a, a thing for her, but I was just too afraid. You know, she was just, she was so pretty, and, and she was confident. Or she was pretty to me. You know, and she may not be pretty to everybody. That's subjective or objective. I don't know the difference between those things. But I saw her and I just, you know, it just, it took, it takes you back. It took me back into that nervous body that I was in for so long as a child. Just that nervous. I used to fix my hair before I left the house when I was young. Dude, what the fuck, bruh? Dude, if I put a comb near my hair right now, one of my sideburns or my, the back of my hair, this sweet, some people call it a mullet. I call it the Lord's work. But that, if I put if I put a comb near my hair, one of my sideburns would reach out and choke a, choke that fucking comb out. Let's, come on, come on. So, but there I was. I was back there, and then you know it was just nice because then you know I was talking to her for a few minutes, and and it just took me back to my nervous body. You know, back when I, I, I you know, I, I wish. I always had my, I remember sometimes I'd be so nervous as a kid. I would have my hands just on my pants like this, like folded up like little penguin arms as it, even if they weren't in my pocket, sometimes I would put my hands just on my hips and I think they were in my pockets and they weren't. And people would be like, dude, what the fuck, bro? Are you like just feeling your thighs, dude, out here in the hallway? You better G up. You better G up. Do you need a Red Bull, baby boy? You better G up. <sighs> yeah, and so that's one thing I'm glad. I'm glad that I went back because I don't have the regret. You know, I was, you know, I was sad that I had to miss the comedy show, but I don't have the regret of, of, of not participating, really. I just didn't want to not be a participant. You know, I didn't want to not honor that time in my life. And some people couldn't. They have children and they have... You know, some people might have died, you know, and they, fuck, they might have been there. You don't know how many ghosts was there. You know what I'm saying? They don't do a, uh, they don't, do, you know, they, it's not like they had a seance in the room or somebody that can operate a crystal ball decently to tell us how many, you know, how many real G's ghosts were in the building. So they might have had a couple spirits out there. But it just, all of a sudden, you know, it just reminded me of, of all these moments, of all these moments and just being young. And I remember getting so high one time driving to school and just hit, you know, hit some girl's car with my car. And I got out of the car and I didn't even know what had happened. I thought our cars, I was like, I remember asking if our, if our cars had magnets in them. And maybe that's why they hit each other. 
She was like, what the fuck? She's like, you hit me. I was like, ah, I think these cars have magnets in them, dude. And I thought they did. I was just, I was high as hell, dude. I was an idiot. But when your whole body's just running on testosterone when you're young, when you cough and you just have t- just some testosterone will fly out of your face. But our old principal showed up, this dude. I thought his name was Coach Pat and his name was Coach Rob. I, didn't, I never saw him. You know, I saw the disciplinarian. You know, I knew that lady. She looked like a kind of like a little bit like Big Bird a little bit, but a little bit hotter. I never thought Big Bird was attractive. But, you know, I saw, uh, co- you know, our principal. That was cool. And I, dude, on the low, he on the DL, he told me, and I shouldn't be, you know, maybe I'm sharing that, but whatever. He was like, you know, I thought, uh, he, he said, I thought so-and-so was a real bitch back in the day. And, dude, just to hear your old principal say that about a, somebody else that worked in the school system, amen. That made it worth it right there. But, yeah, it was just nice to see other people. And, and there were other people that showed up. You know, one girl only went to our school for two years, and she showed up. And then, um, you know, another young lady that's a school teacher now, some guy that just, you know, his wife just got locked up. And so he's out there free, you know, and he got his hair, he kind of got his hair kind of styled up and he's G'd out and he, you know, bought himself some new Giorgio Armani cologne and he's out there stunting in a Mustang now. But you just see people's lives just turning, people hitting different chapters. And and so, yeah, that's why I'm glad I went because, because at the end of the night, I was talking to a couple of gals and a couple of fellas and I realized that, you know, if, if if, if we don't show up, then there is no reunion. That's what makes it a reunion is people showing up. Because, yeah, everything and everything we want to put on or do or be a part of, yeah, it, it could not be shit unless we show up and participate. So that's when I realized, look, you know, all this thing is, is us showing up. And that's what I'm realizing a lot of things are. It's just you got to show up. You got to show up. And then you see what happened. And I ended up having a good time. You know, I'd stepped out of my paleo diet because I was in Louisiana. And dude, it, bro, something will crawl into your mouth in Louisiana. And at first you'll be scared because you're like, what in the fuck is in my mouth? But then you'll chew it up and you'll be like, God damn, that was good. That was good. And so that's just, you know, you if you're on, they don't have diets in Louisiana, really. I mean, except for trying not to get murdered. That's like the number one diet in New Orleans area in Baton Rouge. But it was a joy, man. It was a joy just seeing people and, you know, just seeing what everybody's going through and seeing that dude who made prosthetics. You know, that shit's amazing to me. Imagine having that extra leg. Imagine having that detachable leg. You're trying to go out, you know, maybe you're going fishing and you want to keep some of your nice legs dry. So you put on some, you know, some linoleum, you know, baby boys. You know, you set, you, you, you know, you screw in a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, uh, not mahogany, but um, a couple of velour hips or something. You know, you 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 screw in some uh, some velour calves and ankles. Imagine that. Or you want you know you're just gonna relax in the other room and read. So you put on some fucking goose skin um, femurs. Imagine that. That's the future. That's the future. You know, a lot of things are going to change in the future that people haven't started to think about. And one of those things is you're going to have pants. In the future, they're going to have pants that if you want you want to go run, put on your jogging pants. And old jogging pants, the ones we have right now, they don't do shit. You still got a jog. They're just really just pants. False advertising. But in the future, in La Futura, you're going to put on some jogging pants that are going to, and you're going to press a button and those bitches are going to go about four miles. So you better be ready. Dude, can you imagine how great that's going to be when you have pants and you press that button and then you're off? You could, you could be tight. You could text while you're in them. You could do what you want. You just got to wave every now and then when you pass the neighbors or you got to whistle every now and then when you pass somebody that's sexy. And it could be a man or a woman. I'm not talking about just cat calling women. People get upset about that. But those new, dude, you can have karate kick pants. Somebody's talking shit. You going out to the club, whatever. 
Put on them bad cats. Put on them strike force jeans. He's going to say strike force down the side. And first you out there doing a little bit of cap aware and then shut down. You hit somebody with that electric foot. And that's the type of stuff we're going to have in the future. We're going to have types of clothes that will activate to do what we want to do. You know, you're going to have one of them hug sweaters. Be like, oh, shit. Aunt Mary wore her hug sweater. <laughs> She's going to be. And last year it and last year it malfunctioned. So she was just, you know, she wouldn't let go of the dog for an hour. Because you're going to have that hug sweater just, you just start hugging people. Hi, gee, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. And that thing shorts out a little bit and next thing you know, you get electrocuted. So anything's possible is what I'm saying. But yeah, I'm glad that I went home. Man, this podcast is starting to catch up. Look, I was in, I went to meet my sister. My sister has two beautiful children and um, and I love them. And they're so, you know, they love me. They think I'm funny. And that makes me feel good. You know, they think I'm like a goofy guy. And that's fun because I get to be that around them. And so we went to pizza. And they live out in the country. I mean, they live by the interstate. Like, it's one of those houses where when you're driving by on the interstate, you're like, dang, they shouldn't live that close to the interstate. Uh, and they got a bass. They have a fish tank with a bass in it. And it can't. the bass can't even turn around. The bass is too big. The tank is just about the size of like a shoebox. So the bass, they have to feed it just at the front of the tank because the bass can't even, that's just a one-way fish. And uh, and we went, I went and met my sister and my mom was going to meet us and then my mom couldn't come. And, uh, and my feelings got a little bit hurt, uh, you know, because I guess, you know, when I, my relationship with my mother has been, I've always felt, and I, I just realized this, when I was there, we were going to meet up with my mom and then she couldn't come. She had to work. And my mom does delivery, you know, she delivers, you know, magazines and newspapers and that. And she had, she got a delivery called and she had to do it. And I respect that because she has to work, you know, she has to survive. Um, and, and she got her husband, Mr. Charlie, and he got Alzheimer's. And that's when your brain goes to heaven, but you still down here fucking milling around. And so he got, you know, he's over. You know, he's, out, he's sitting in the passenger seat, so he has to go everywhere she goes. So my mom's out there in that van, in that windowless van, you know, just dropping off, uh, you know, magazines and, you know, special specialty booklets. And Mr. Charlie's just out there just, you know, he's out there Apollo 13, and bruh. He's out there just working freelance in his own skin. But she couldn't come, man. And it made me think, you know what? And it, for, at first it hurt my feelings and I was, I was kind of mad at her. But then I was trying to think, well, why am I mad? And I guess a lot of times for me, my mother has always had to work. You know, the hardest working man I, I've ever known was my mother. And so, you know, I guess I was just mad because she wasn't available. You know, it's always like my whole life, every time I've tried to like do something special for my mom or because I was trying to surprise her. That's the thing. I was trying to surprise her by meeting up with my nieces and going to, to dinner with her. And, and so, and she couldn't come, you know, and I think that's, and it just kind of, I don't know, man, it's kind of lame, I guess, or not lame, but, you know, it just, most of my life, my mother hasn't been available. You know, she's always been busy. She's always had something to do. She's always felt a lot of pressure to, and I don't know where it comes from, you know, cause I wasn't there when my mother was a child. But she's always just been so busy that it's hard to get her out of whatever her busy is. It's hard. It's hard to get a moment with her where I feel like we just can be okay around each other and okay together. And so that shit kind of hurt my feelings, but I had to just swallow it. I had to shut up and just say nothing because what am I going to, you know, you know, I just have to be grateful that my mother has work and that she is able to work because she likes to work. And that's that's all I can do, you know? At this point, it's not worth sometimes saying the things. It's just, you know, I just tell her I love her and we go on, and that's it. You know, at some point, it's like, if I'm just, if I, if I'm just playing old songs from back, you know, complain, you know, and just, it is what it is. What am I gonna do? 
you know, I can let her know, oh, you know, I really wish we could spend more time together. Those are things that I can do, but, but to sit there and hold it against her. And then my mother still has to work, but now she has to feel bad. You know, that's just what I didn't want to do. So I had to swallow my own ego and stuff and, um, and just kind of get through that moment. But a lot of sacrificers out there, you know, a lot of people sacrifice for our country. A lot of women and men have sacrificed for their family, their time, their dreams. You know, sometimes I don't think we, you know, I, I don't ever think about that. Like, I wonder what my mom's dreams were when she was little. You know, I wonder if in the future we'll be able to travel back into our, into our, like our, and through our genetics into our parents and our grandparents' thoughts. Wouldn't that be fascinating? Like you're not traveling through time because that seems, I don't think it seems far-fetched, you know, because we have those moments of, you know, man, I feel like I've been here before, but but to travel through our genetics to me seems more plausible, you know, because that's a real thing that's living inside of us. And I definitely feel like our bodies have memory. I feel sometimes like there's a brain in my heart. You know, because I'll get feelings in my heart that are, they're more than just a, a, an ache or a want. It's a, sometimes in my heart, I can feel like a, almost a, like it's like my heart is like curious or like my heart is thinking. And that may sound crazy, but, and that's just me explaining some of the feelings that I have. But I think we're going to really start to find that that our bodies have so much more ability to mem to memorize and to think uh, than we realize and not just our brains. Because I, even I'll say this, man, I've been on this paleo diet, you know, and paleo's diet is, it's basically you're a scavenger, you're a hunter. I mean, you could fucking kill somebody in a parking lot, you know, in the afternoon, you won't think twice about it. And that's what's, you know, it's really interesting about the diet is it's, you know, Apparently, you can have um, fruits, you can have lean meat, and you can murder. Those are all okay on this diet. And eggs. And, and pure maple syrup for a sweetener. But I start to, I start to realize, like, I, now I start to notice that I eat only because I need to eat. And my, my, my body doesn't feel as addicted to uh, whatever, like, chemicals and extra preservatives and things like that that are in a lot of processed foods. I'm not saying I'll always be on this diet. I'm not preaching at you. I'm just telling you shit I'll notice. So I notice that. Like, so my, my stomach doesn't get real hungry. I have a thought that I, instead of a, 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 a memory that comes from my stomach, my stomach like being like, oh, I need to eat. I need to eat. I'm starving. Instead, I get a thought in my head that says, hey, uh, it's probably time to eat. You know, you should eat in the next couple hours. It's more of a survival. It's more instinctual. But I'm noticing that before I would get this almost like this addiction or this 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 craving, like this memory that my stomach had of of whatever chemicals I was putting into it or whatever preservatives and stuff were going into my stomach. And I don't get that now. And so that's another thing that's making me think, oh, well, maybe our stomachs do have and our other organs do have a lot more memory than we think they do. Now, that's, imagine that. If you could, if you... Who knows? Who knows what the future has? You know as sure as hell they're going to have a hat that can comb your hair. Damn. You see fucking Rhonda put on that top hat and she's fucking permed up an hour later? Gotta get me one of those. I want that. I want that boat. So those are some things that have just been going through my head. You know, it's just, it's just, it is what it is. It is what it is. But yeah, I had a good time, man. I spent some time with uh, one of my friends. We went around, you know, and we got dressed up and we went over to that high school reunion and we made the most of it. And we didn't have a DJ at that thing because, you know, not enough people came. We couldn't afford that DJ. But somebody started singing a little bit in the evening. And, and what else? It was just a nice flight. I saw Arsenio Hall on the way back. And so that was pretty cool because Arsenio was the first uh, and the only late night talk show host who would put me on his show uh, to do stand up comedy. And this is about four years ago, and all the other ones passed on my tape, and, uh, and he put me on. 
And it made me wonder also, why, why are all the late night talk show hosts white? You know, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with them being white or not being white, but it seems a little, you know, like I wouldn't mind uh, somebody that's mixed at the least. You know, you guys can't get at least a, a, a white person that was raised by uh, black parents. You know, let's get, or what about a sweet, a beautiful Asian? Or how about a sweet Latino? That nighttime Vialo. You know, I just wouldn't mind seeing, a, you know, they really got it cornered out there with these whites on these late night shows. But then sometimes I just want to see diversity and, some, and things just to make it more interesting. You know, a lot of, I don't, you know, I agree sometimes with the forced diversity thing. I don't like it. Because I don't know if it, if it, if it imitates life sometimes. But it's just like the NBA. The NBA gets really boring to me because it's all tall black men. It's just, because here's why. Because when I watch it, I don't feel like everybody has a chance to be in it. So for me, I lose that allure. You know, it's like, oh, well, I can't even, I'd have no shot to be in this. What about that 50-year-old, you know, Vietnamese gunner out on the three-point line? You know you want to see that dude. Whatever his name is, little Starbuck or whatever. You know you want to see Starbuck out there at that three-point stripe wearing pants, dude. And if you don't know that a lot of Vietnamese men play basketball in pants, then you don't know. Get out there and meet some men. Because they got men out there. Some beautiful vietes out there. Just pantalones. Fashonis, boy. And just gunning from deep. Dude, you'll see a guy shoot from 70 feet with a volleyball. Bang, bang. That's a nine-pointer, baby. So I'm just saying that I would like to see that. You know, you you telling me you can't find, uh, you know, a, a Kobe Bryant, a little a J, little Japanese guy or a lot of Mexican guy, dude. Come on, I just want you know I, I want to see it because I want to see it. Then that seems like more of a team. That that's more of a a, a a sport that exemplifies everything. You know, that's why I want to see a golfer in the, in a wheelchair and put him in the fucking. You know, I want to see him set a break on a really steep hill and fucking hit that uh that six iron. A hundred and uh, hundred and forty yards. I want to see people set it off. You know, and sure he get shit gets risky on that hillside if it's windy. Or if it's slope, you know, if it there's a uh small avalanche. But whatever, you gotta get a little bit extra insurance on that guy. Cause he's out there. But I, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing that. Or seeing somebody with no arms be in the swim competition. Get in the pool. That's Sally right there. And they call him Sally Mander. And that dude be out there just, just face first, boy, just snaking. Just, just snaking through that. And I want that's the vibe I want to see. That Viallo. I don't, you know, I'll mix it all together. Let's see who really wins this shit. That's what I want to see sometimes. I just want to see, I don't want forced diversity, but I want to see things mixed, but so that it just feels like fucking reality. Because you're telling me this dude, they got men out there seven feet tall and the, the goal is only 10 feet. That's not hard to play on, dude. That's easy. And matter of fact, that's easy. Put that thing at 13 feet. Let's see who's a real moonwalker then. Sorry, I didn't mean to go off, but I just get cued in and I'm, I get fired up. But thank you guys for, for being here on this past weekend. You know what's crazy? We're coming up on 100 episodes. Uh, isn't that wild? 100 episodes. And I remember we started this thing on December, I want to say December 19th or December 18th. I don't even know, honestly. I should look. But man, I want to thank you guys so much for being here with us so far. And things are growing so fast and we have so much neat stuff happening. And I really, really want to thank you guys. I want to say we have some uh, some great dates coming up. One of those is going to be in West Siloam Springs, and that's coming up at Cherokee Casino, West Siloam Springs, Oklahoma. Now, if you know somebody in that area that's a single mother who doesn't usually get out, that we could accommodate their evening, you know, uh, take care of them, get them and a friend out to a show, and take care of their babysitter, um, let us know. And you can hit me up um 
theovon.com um, under contact on there or theovon.com slash podcast. There's a way to get in touch right there. And, and, and you may not know anybody and that's fine. And I wouldn't say anything to them yet or anything like that. But if you do know somebody in that area, Cherokee Casino, I'll be there June 9th and that's in two weeks. Uh, West Siloam Springs, Oklahoma. Hit us up on the hotline or um, through the uh, website and let us know. And we're going to see if we can't do something nice out there for a single mom and get this little program rolling. June 15th through 16th, Yuck Yucks, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. June 23rd, Timbler Brewing Company, Bakersfield. We just added a second show. June 29th, I'll be at the Paramount Theater in Stark County, Illinois. Um, and that's in the town of Wyoming, Illinois, and that's a fundraiser. July 6th through the 8th at Levity Live in Oxnard, California. July 20th through the 22nd, Charlie Goodnights, Raleigh, North Carolina. Eight, August 16th through 18th, Laugh Factory, Chicago. September 14th and 15th, that's Zanies in Nashville, Tennessee. October 18th through the 20th, that's Skyline Comedy Club, Appleton, Wisconsin. November 1 through 3, Helium Comedy Club, Buffalo, New York. We're also adding dates, I believe, for Toronto and who knows where else. All right. Uh, the hotline, as always, is 985-664-9503. Uh, let's get into a few calls here. Here we go. Hey, Leo. This is John. It's Theo, but let's hear more, John. Thank you for calling. Amelia. And Tom. And my two cats. John, Amelia, Tom, and two cats. Boy, that sounds like a, sound like a low-key swingers meetup over there in Connecticut or something. That sounds like something rich people doing. Onwards. And we got a story for you. So we live in this town called Cold Snake, New Jersey. It's in New Jersey, and uh, right next to us is a town called Homedale. And just the other day, a story broke where the Homedale High School superintendent was found out to be shitting on the track of their school. Okay, so you're talking about defecation, athletics, onward? Every day. <laughs> They found that they were like, the janitors had to clean it up every single day, and they were like, who's doing this? And they eventually caught him on surveillance, and it was the superintendent of the school, Amelia, who has said her name before, pointed out that that just is something that we need to tell to Theo Vaughn. Well, I appreciate you calling this in, uh, John, Amelia, and Tom. Well, yeah, I mean, the guy, you said he was doing it daily. I'm not surprised by that, because people defecate daily. I don't trust anybody that doesn't uh, defecate six times a week. If you out there defecating five times, then that's pretty crazy. Because that means you're just running around as, you know, you're just hiding, you know, defecation in your body. You know, you're just out there, you're just muling your own dookie around. You're just a dookie mule for yourself. Get it out of your body. You got to do six times a week. I got, I, I, I got an old friend, you know, and I had to let him go because he only shit twice a week. Huh? So that means every time I'm talking to you, you just, you got like, a, you know, you got probably about 60 grams of just defecation, just hanging out in your body for no reason because you're too lazy to let it out. It's like somebody that, that doesn't take their dog for a walk. You know what I'm saying? You got to take those body dogs for a walk and just walk them right into that tank, into that bathroom tank, that toilet. So it just, if somebody ain't shitting six times a week, then, then are we friends? Uh, ha. I don't know. I really don't know. But look, this man is superintendent of schools. Obviously, he was probably fed up with his job and he just couldn't find a way to do it. And also, once you start doing stuff outdoors and you start, you know, you get out more outdoors, you, that stuff gets addictive. You know, you go for one run, you want to go for another run. You know, and if you shit probably once on a track, then, you know, I could see, I could see probably doing it, you know, it, it getting probably addictive. I mean, addiction is crazy. People are addicted to everything. There's people addicted. There are meetings for in, in Los Angeles for people who are addicted to chapstick. There's, there's meetings for people who are addicted to um, not blinking. There's people that don't want to blink. Think about that. Just dry-eyed as fuck. Just trying to hold them open all day until they go to bed at night. That's the dark arts. And there's people like that. So I'm not surprised. The superintendent of schools, he probably got some ego. He thinks he's this big bad dude. He's running the show. And next thing you know, he's out there defecating. And also, though, maybe he didn't like his janitorial staff. Maybe he thought the staff was slacking. Maybe this is his last term and he didn't give a damn. 
Maybe he's trying to get a new mascot. You know, the you know the bomb the brown bombers, and this dude's just trying to, you know, lay a, you know lay a track in people's heads first before he, you know, th- lobs that name that name out there. But I appreciate you guys calling in. I don't trust anybody that don't shit six times a week, and I don't think that you should. But I'm not here to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. But I'll tell you what I'm doing. And I'm not pe- I'm, I'm not trusting people that that don't go number two when they have to do it. What are you doing? Your body is saying, hey, I'm all good here. And you're saying, nah, you keep that in your mouth. Come on, come on. Who are we? Are we rhythm or are we dancers? Let's take another call here. Thank you guys for calling in from uh, Great Neck, New Jersey, or Colts Neck or whatever it was, something, um, someplace out there in uh, the beautiful New Jersey, real people out there, and I respect it. Onward. Good for you. Um, just calling in maybe for a little advice. Um, Thanks for calling. I don't have advice for you, but I'll definitely, I'll give you some, I'll give you a suggestion that I have. And I don't say that, you know, it's kind of to reprimand you in any way, but, but for me, I don't hear advice that well, but I hear suggestions because, you know, advice, if I get advice from people, it makes me think for me, it makes me think that that person thinks they know more than me. And for some reason, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a, I've always, you know, or when I was young, I had to always do things for myself. And so I don't like to take other people's advice because, you know, there's something inside of me that's like, oh, I'm not listening to that person. You know, I, 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 I've always taken care of myself. I know, I know, I know what's best for me, but a suggestion, I'm able to hear those a little bit more. And so I'm going to offer a suggestion though. And I do appreciate you calling, man. It's brave of you to call and hit the hotline. 985-664-9503. Thanks for calling. Let's hear more. I am currently living with my parents. Okay, you currently living with the rents, dude, and that's okay. You know what I don't like about living with the parents, though, is uh, you got to smell other people's bodies. You know, your parents, it's cool when you're young because they're smelling you. You're the one making the smells around the house. But when you get a little older and you're still at your folks' house, then you start smelling them, and it's like, oh, oh. Why? Just graduated. I um, have a full time job, starting a career. Wow, good. And uh, my girlfriend wants to move in with me. Hmm. And that's the you know that's that new age lady. A lot of these new age ladies. Yeah. When I was young, you would put a ladder on your lady's door and sneak up there at night. And then right when you got into her bedroom, her dad would pop up from behind the bed and punch you in the fucking neck. But now you got these ladies, they trying to sneak in. You know, you don't even know. I unpacked one of my bags at home the other day, had two ladies in it. Like, who were these ladies? But thanks for calling onward. And uh, I got a little bit of student debt, um, and money's a little bit tight, but I can do it and it's feasible. And um, so I'm just wondering if, you know, this is the right decision, what your thoughts and comments are about it. I'm 24. Wow. So I think it's time to, you know, get out of my parents' house and move on. Um, but scary, you know, I already made a decision that I think I'm going to do it, but so I was wondering if you had any uh, advice, you know, thoughts, comments for me. There you go. And I appreciate you calling. Uh, and, I, and I'll say this about moving out. You know, it sounds like you're a responsible guy. And I, I applaud that. I mean, a lot of 24-year-olds, they don't even know. A lot of these kids out there sitting in their front yard on LSD, you know, just trying to figure out if their toes are in the best order naturally, you know, by height or whatever, classification, whatever. But you sound, you know, you sound like, you, you know, you labeled off a couple of things. You have a job, you just graduated, you're working full time, you're managing, you're juggling a relationship, you know, you're understanding that you're moving out and that there's some responsibility added there. Man, it sounds like you're doing okay. I think you're going to be fine. And I'll say this, man, I don't know your parents, but I'm proud of you, dude. I, look, I have zero kids, but I would be so proud if you were my kid. I mean, you sound like a, you sound like somebody that cares about yourself, that's taken a lot of responsibility. And so and your parents will always be there. If, if things get tough and you have to go back, that's, that's not taking a loss, that's taking a learn. You know, through any experience, even if it doesn't work out for you, 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 you can take an L. 
And that L can be a learning, you know, and I, and I actually, that's a, um, our charter sponsor is gray block pizza. And the man that runs, uh, that started that company is this gentleman, Thomas. And he taught me about that. Uh, and it's, and it's helped me. It's helped me when I feel like, damn, I lost that shit, but nah, I learned it. And next time I'll do it differently. Yeah. I mean, look, you're going to have some freedom though. You're going to have some freedom. You know, your parents will probably look at you a little different. You'll start to, you know, get some different airs. Some new ideas will come into your head when you're in a space because when you put yourself in, in, in uncomfort, um, you know, your your brain will find ways and uh, and the world will find ways a lot of times to to even things out for you, to get you back into comfort. And so you don't know the world might give you a new opportunity. Um, your brain might look at things a little bit differently and find a way to uh, make something in your life that was tougher before, make it easier for you now. You know, it's amazing what what pressure uh, can do to your to your brain, what positive pressure. And I consider moving out, you know, I consider that putting like a positive pressure on yourself. You know, because it's, you know, it's amazing what, 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 what is inside of us, what our higher powers or whatever put inside of us. Dude, we're, we are remarkable creatures. I mean, we're also straight Muppets. You know, somebody right now is listening to this and just walked into traffic. And you know what? We appreciate them taking one for the team. But it's, uh, we're remarkable creatures in the sense that when we put ourselves into uncomfort, when we put ourselves into change, that, that we will a lot of times rise to the occasion. Or, and you sound like somebody that, that, that might. You, sound like, you really sound like somebody that might. So I say give it a shot. And you can always take a learn. You can always take a step back. I'm sure your parents would love to have you back in the house. I don't know them. You know, maybe they're getting tired of splitting that pizza. You know, maybe y'all all getting tired of smelling each other, but, you know, I, I'm sure you sound like a nice, uh, a good son. And I bet that they're super proud of you. And I'm sure that they would be happy to have you in the house if you got to go back. Look, I moved in and out of the house nine times with a family that wasn't even mine. So, so it's okay if you have to. And with the girlfriend situation... Now, having her move in with you immediately when you get out, I mean, maybe that's what you're, maybe you're headed for marriage and that's where you're looking for. You know, maybe I might take a set, you know, take a secondary beat there and just kind of feel that out a little bit more. You know, even if it's just a couple weeks by yourself, but if she's already living with you and you guys are going together, then go do it. You know, you can always take a step sideways and that's just a step to, uh, to think about things or you can always, um, take a learn brother. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's get onward and take another question. Onward. Hey, what's up, Dio? It's uh, Brian from Los Angeles. What's up, Brian from Los Angeles? Thanks for calling in. But uh, this is more kind of like a recommendation, or just kind of like train of thought kind of thing. Okay. You had um, that one homeboy for uh, from Greyhound. We just kind of talked to him. Yeah, we had the Greyhound driver. Um. And I, you know, I hate to say it, I can't even remember his name at the moment. He stood us up and then he came in, didn't really say much, but he was, he was nice. But, uh, but yeah, I, he might've been a plant. He might've been a government plant. Uh, onward. Just try to get into his mind about how, uh, how it works. But, uh, what's wrong with, uh, getting people on your podcast, whether they're, uh, mechanic, doctors, uh, chefs. You know, anything like that, you know, just to get their insights, their experience, things that they see, you know what I mean? Because I'm, I'm a mechanic, you know what I mean? I just want to, like, say that to you, you know, because there's, there's a couple crazy stories, you know what I mean, out there. I appreciate that call, Brian. Yeah, well, look, I'm trying not to close off my mind to any type of guest. You know, I'm still learning a lot about being with guests. You know, some guests, they, it's almost like a script with them. They just go into it and start communicating and you, it's hard to even get questions in. Um, uh, you know, I want to get people in that I can conversate more with. I want to have people in that I have some sort of uh, a purpose to talk to. And, and you're right, that, that should be anyone. And it is, you know, but it's also like you get a guy, you know, you think that you get a guy who's going to be 
uh, have a lot to share and a lot of insight, like the Greyhound driver, and he didn't have much. And that's why we have to do another Greyhound episode coming up when we're looking for a better driver. If you know anybody that has worked for Greyhound who lives in the Los Angeles area, we'll pay them for their time, but we'd love to have them come on. Um, so you can hit the hotline and let us know that. But look, I want to have all types of regular people, you know, anybody, people that can uh, hold their breath, midwives, um, con artists, uh, you know, people that were um, maybe were accused of, you know, you know, dirty crimes, rapists or whatever, but didn't do it, didn't do it. You know, murderers who share who did their time. I'm interested in anybody. And if there's somebody out there that you think has a, you have a really special guest that you think is great, hit the hotline. Let us know. Make sure they live in Los Angeles. Because I'm saying we don't have that kind of a budget. But we will, uh, you know, we want to have interesting people on and we're going to continue to. But I appreciate you saying that, Brian. Yeah, everybody has a story. But we also have to make sure that people can, you know, have some ability to share that story so that we can. Just because we owe that to our listeners and we owe that to ourselves. And we also don't want to get somebody in here and make them feel uncomfortable. You know, if you get some cats like to get their hair cut, like to get their hair styled. You know, sometimes you'll see a cat with a little bit of a, a jerry curl around its asshole. But sometimes you get a cat and you break out that hair coloring kit and they jump out the seat. And that's, that's not the kind of cat we want. We want the cat that's ready to have a little bit of S curl or a finger wave around that around that anus, that anus. Let's hear more. Uh, let's take another call here. And look, we'll go in and out of the calls. It's not like once we get into the calls, we go through the calls. It's, this is what it is. This is Memorial Day weekend. You know, people died so we could do this however we want. You know, people, can you believe that people died? People died, man. Some of you listeners right now, you lost some of you lost a family member. You know, were you looking at some of y'all, you know, scratching a ghost leg or gross, uh, uh, you know, trying to scratch your arm right now. You don't even have an arm because you left your arm in another country. Defending this one. I, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for this country. We're going to do great things. I'm not sitting here listening to the news telling me this and that and fighting about who should be here and who shouldn't be here. Onward, baby. I'm moving onward. If somebody needs help and I'm there, I'm going to help. But I'm not falling into this trap of this bullshit constantly baiting me into thinking that America's bad. Things are going okay. And I think actually things are going better than okay. I think we're, I think we're in a better place now than we were 10 years ago. I hope we are. I think we have a lot of the same problems. But I think we need to start thinking more about solution and just quit complaining about everything. What is the solution? How, what do we find it? And I fall into it too, man. We all do. Maybe we all don't. I do. You know, I get caught up in the complaints. If you need me, I'll be in the complaints section trying on a, a couple of complaints. You know? How does this, uh, you know, this... uh? You know, how does this uh, this this uh, uh, complain uh, dress fit me? Just trying on complaints. Oh, how does this uh, shoulda, woulda, coulda wife beater fit me? Is it too tight? Let's take another call. Here we go. Yo, what's up, Theo? This is uh, Eric calling in from California. Hey, Eric from California. Uh, California. I'm in your state as well right now. Thank you for calling, brother. Onward. Uh, Northern California. Uh, been listening to your podcast. Just heard the, this one last past week where you were on Joe Rogan's. and Yeah, and uh, thank you for listening to that too, man. Joe sent me a text um, on Friday saying how uh, he'd gotten such a nice response. And, man, I got such a great response. I can't even tell you. Uh, no joke, I think I got maybe three, 4,000 DMs just about the podcast. But what? I can't e It would take me two months to respond to all of them. And I've tried on some. It's just overwhelming. You know, it's overwhelming even just be on your phone that much. But thank you guys so much for people that have reached out and uh, and just said that they enjoyed listening to that. I enjoyed it. I talked about it on my last episode. Onward. That's that 64 box coloring right there, boy. <laughs> but uh, I heard you uh, 
come back and contemplating, like, thinking that whole universe, like, if you would have met yourself, would you be, like, proud or, you know, how would you feel? And <clears throat> I've been kind of thinking about that myself. And, uh, man, you know, as silly as this might sound, that's kind of what I needed to hear to, to just put the fucking bottle down, man. Mm. I figured if I met myself, I wouldn't like who I was meeting. Uh, I was about to pour myself a drink, and I just decided not to, you know? Because I wouldn't like that guy. But uh just made me think a little. Uh, thanks, Theo. Thank you. Thanks for the call. Yeah, well, Joe made me think. And we're just out here playing telephone, making people think. But I'm glad I could help you think a little bit. Yeah, sometimes I've been to those moments like, what is this next one going to do for me? Or what is this next, you know, page of pornography? Or what is this next, you know, mean text? Or what is this next, uh, you know, hit off this joint? Or what is this next gram of cocaine? Or what is this next... Um, you know, uh, parking in my neighbor's yard or what is this, when, what is it going to do for me? You know, I get to the, I, I've been to those moments where it just run, like, you know, things work for you, even if they're things that aren't good for you, they work for you until they don't work anymore. And then for me, I have to ask myself, well, why, 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 what am I using this for in the first place? Is it a thought that I don't want to think about? Is it an uncomfort? Like if I don't pour that beer, then I just sit there uncomfortable. What is that uncomfort? What is it? Because that's what my real, that's what my, that's my dark artist. Whatever that uncomfort is that makes me get to the point where whatever I'm using to check out of myself, whatever I'm using to escape doesn't work, then that's when that's when it's like, okay, I need to look, I need to, I need to look at this a little more. What am I, what am I? I don't feel good about what? I don't feel good about what I'm doing. I don't feel good about what somebody's doing to me. I don't feel I feel less than, I feel uh uh shameful. What do I, you know, what do I feel? And that's what, you know, that for me, that kind of stuff is that's where that all that goes. Is starting then that self-exploration. And I'm just out here spelunking into myself, trying to. Huh. It's a dirty, man, this can be a dirty road we live on. But, but they got a lot of tables of water set up as we're jogging it, don't they? And we get those hitters from different people. You know, and I listen to Joe and, and you listen here and, and then somebody else listens to this now because you called in and we're all, we're all thinking. You know, we're all thinking. Oh. Onward, let's hear more. Thanks for calling, Eric. And also, if you fucking party and do shit and you're doing it good, keep on. Keep on. Here we go. Hey, how's it going? Theo Vaughn and to anyone listening. All right, so I was just calling in to give my um, best worst weekend. Okay, and this will be the last uh, This will be the last submission for this week. Each week we have, you can call in and let us know what your best or worst weekend, how your weekend was, if it was the best or worst. Make sure it's, it's one or the other. Don't call in with some mediocre weekend, you know. You and Gunther went over to the lake or something, you know, and ate a jar of olives together. Because you know why? Don't give a fuck. I want to hear something wild, you know. Somebody swallowed a damn barbell or something. It needs to be interesting. Um, but thank you for calling. You can hit those. You can, on those stories, you can leave them at 985-664-9503 on the hotline. Once a month, we'll take the best or worst weekend, whichever one it was, uh, whoever that was in cinema uh, this past weekend package. It's got um, it's got these, uh, these uh, uh, correctional center blue T-shirts, and we'll send you one of those and a couple of other uh, items. Onward. On my way home from work. And I I bike to and from work. I'm about seven miles away. So it's about nine o'clock. I'm heading down. It's dark. So I'm flying maybe thirty miles an hour. Okay, you thirty miles an hour on a bicycle. Woo woo! It sounds like you're trying to go uh, buy, catch a bag of dope. Because usually, if you see an adult male doing thirty mphs on a bicicleta, he's after that cocaine. You feel me? He, he dude, he's on that uh tour to dust. <laughs> He's, he's hitting them French Alps. 
to go get them white caps. You feel me? And I'm going, and before I know it, I'm just, you know, I saw the green, and I'm going for it, and I see someone's making a left turn, and I'm just, I see it coming. I had about maybe one second before. I'm like, yep, this is a, yeah, I just let out one big, just, fuck. What do you think it was, a fart? Fuck. Oh, just a fuck, okay. And I just, I smacked the side of his car. And, of course, I go, you know, uh, I fly up a little, you know, dinner goes everywhere. Uh, I'm on the top of his car a little bit, and then I kind of push and roll off and land in the road. Cops end up showing up because he goes ahead and called them, told me I didn't have a light on my bicycle or whatever. And they're, but it's, like, it's okay. Cops show up. They, uh, you know, they just talk some information. It's whatever. It's good. I'm walking. It's all good. The police officer, he did a good thing, and uh, he fixed my bike right there on the spot. So shout out to him, MPD, you know what I mean? Okay, so you had some help from the officers. You hit a car with your bike. You didn't have a light on it. Man, I can't do it. Honestly, I can't stand a lot of times. Sometimes, especially in Los Angeles, they try to force everything into. There's already so much traffic. And then they got, you know, bicyclists and everybody. They got jugglers. They got a lane for unicyclists. They got a lane for people that are afraid to be outside. Uh, they got a lane for people with uh, Iditarod animals. They got a lane for people that um, are afraid of the sunlight. You know, they got a lane for complete bitches. So, in, you know, look, in California, some of this stuff gets way, it gets to be too much. I mean, I don't know if you had a bike helmet on or not. Honestly, I hope you didn't, bro, but not in a bad way for you. I can't trust an adult male that wears a bike helmet. Sorry. I, you know, I, the la I'd rather my dad, you know, be jarred up in the brain than hear him tell me a story about when he got hit by a car and had a helmet on. I just can't because I pit then I would picture him with a helmet, with shorts, riding a bicycle, and then I would just, you know, picture him hopefully just riding on out of my life. Because I can't imagine that as a man that my cheese mo in me, what little I have, I can't imagine I can't imagine a man a, a father of that that is not that's not for me. You know, I want that dad that gets, you know, maybe he gets iced out by that by a Trans Am or something, because I got hit by a Trans Am when I was young, and he didn't have a helmet on, and he's a little different, but he's still my dad. And there's no pictures of him anywhere or proof that he ever wore a bike helmet as an adult male. Is that a, is that a crazy weekend? You, look, it's tough. It sounds tough for you. Dinner went everywhere. You lost the dinner. I feel bad for you, bro. I appreciate you calling with that. If you have a good one or a bad one, you can hit the hotline. Oh, all right. Let's take a, uh, let's take another one. Here we go. Hey, Theo, it's Matt out here in Nashville again. Hey, Matt from Nashville. Uh, thank you for calling. I'll be coming there, I believe, in September onward. Uh, I just wanted to kind of talk to you about smoking cigarettes a little bit because there's something that Ari said a long time ago about when people quit cigarettes, they want to tell everybody around them that they're quitting cigarettes, and everybody goes, oh, congratulations, you know, good for you, but... It kind of jacks up your reward system because you get that that final outcome of what you're looking for. That like, oh, I did it, but you get it in the beginning when you haven't really done any work. Oh, that's interesting, Matt. I'm definitely guilty of that. I'm def yeah. I'll have like two days, you know, or go a few days where I won't smoke or I won't do a certain thing, or and then if I tell people, then it's over. Wow, I never thought about it that the reward system that I get that reward because then I'm like, excuse me, then they hear like, oh, congratulations. And I hear that and I'm like, oh, great. Our, people are already excited. I'm already doing great. And then, then there's no gold medal out there. It's almost the same thing in a way of like that everybody gets a trophy for playing in the ball game. You know, everybody gets a trophy that says you're great at baseball. That's a trophy. You know, one of my nephews got that trophy. You're great at baseball. Everybody got it. What the hell? What does that even mean? So, and one of their kids on their team was blind. He's, you know, he can't see. God bless him. You know, and he might be able to see later. Let's don't feel too sorry for him because we don't know what God has planned for him. You know what I'm saying? He might bust out with those new fucking sight sockets in two years. And he may be, you know, he may, uh, you know, he may go from just black to 64 colors. You know what I'm saying? He may be just that renegade with that Roy G. Biv. He may change the game up. So let's don't feel too sorry for the young guy at this point. But he got one. So now he got to fucking have his, now his, somebody got to read that to him. You're great at baseball. 
So he's sitting there in his head thinking I'm great at baseball, but I can't even fucking see. So then what does he go to do? He turns into evil Knievel. Next thing you know, he thinks he could do anything. You know, and he rides a uh, motorized bike or a motorized cart or something out into traffic. You know, just sometimes we don't want to lead people astray with some of these ideas. And we don't want to give them that reward before there is a reason for it. And I do that. I'm I'm grateful you brought that to my attention because I do that, Matt. You know, I want that. And I don't know if it's that I want the reward. And so that's why I tell people. You know, let's hear more. What do you have to, what what other thoughts do you have, Matt? Quit smoking cigarettes when I did. That was about three years ago. But uh, I'll be honest with you, man. I've been, it's been about three weeks now. I've been back on them. Oh, you back on them. You back on them. Yeah. Oh, they get you. A cigarette, sometimes it seems like they got a long arm sticking out the bottom of them with a strong hand on it. And just when you think you just out there, just like trick long Mickey with them new clean hitters, and then they drag you right back in. More? White hitters. I've been, I've been on a hard again. And uh, so I know how you're feeling, man. I know I know how the struggle is. It's fucking real addiction. But, um, but it's dumb as fuck, too, and you know that, so... I do, and you're right. And you know what I can feel is even, I can feel my lungs start to have a memory of a cigarette. And that's the thing that gets scary is when you can feel your lungs like, oh, oh, uh, you know, it's almost like they're, like, they're, like they're thinking. I can feel my lungs almost thinking about a cigarette. And that might sound crazy, but wouldn't be surprised if I am. Thanks for calling up, Matt. Yeah, maybe I should watch out with that reward system, but, you know, just giving myself the, you're great at baseball. And I've only been, you know, barely swinging a bat for two days. Oh, let's crack into more. Um, hey, Mr. Vaughn. I just finished watching that uh, tinfoil hat podcast when you were there with uh, Eddie Bravo. <laughs> at, at one point, man, it was so funny. You looked like you looked like me in my, my first calculus class when the teacher tells me, yeah, calculus, you remember that time? In the fifth grade, when you when they taught you this, was the same thing, and it just blew my mind that they wanted me to remember all that stuff after years and years. It was so funny, man. Well, thanks for calling in about that. Yeah, I went on Tim Foil Hat Podcast. If you haven't seen this podcast, it's um, you know, they talk a lot about it's with Eddie Bravo and Sam Tripoli, uh, two men that I that I really admire that make me laugh and um, and. They man, they're, but they're it's it was off the deep end. I didn't think it was that deep that some people are out there talking about, you know, just things that they see in their in their you know, you know, it was everything. And one it, by the I just it was like JFK, you know, Loch Ness monster, um, uh, booby traps, booby traps, uh, uh, um, you know, we didn't land on the moon. You know, it was just. Tower seven, tower sixty two. I, I I couldn't even function. I thought I was going to end up on a list, and I had to I had to bow out. You know, I'm certainly open to talking about some of those things, conspiracy theor- theories, flat Earth, thinking about that. But this was deep. This was deep, and and I didn't know that people went that deep. And that to me, I don't want to be in that depth. I do not want to be in that depth because I can't handle it. I couldn't handle it. It was too much at once for me. So I think I need to wait in the water. I got to get in there easy. I got to take it in slow. You know, I got to get in there slow. That's the deep end for me. Uh, but thanks for calling in about that, about that tinfoil hat podcast. And look, I was thinking about this, about the moon landing. Here's one thing that strikes me about the moon landing. For one, I've met Buzz Aldrin and I looked in his eyes. And he didn't look, to me, it didn't look like he had been to the moon. And I'm not saying that, you know, everybody got that special lunar glow in their eye. You know, everybody's got that galactic twinkle in one of their fucking face balls if they have been to the moon. But he didn't have it for me. You know, sometimes you meet somebody and it looks like, oh, yeah, it looks like they've been to Canada or it looks like they've been to Africa or they look, you know, exhausted and they smell like popcorn and it looks like they've been to the mall. Well, I looked at uh, Mr. B. Aldrin and I looked at him and I was like, hmm, 
the look in his eyes, it didn't look like he had been to the moon. Now, that's just what I'm saying. Also, I was thinking about this. Can you believe that we, tr we sent manned mission to the moon and successfully did it the first time? What? What? Dude, nobody does anything right the first time. What are the odds that we did it the first time? That's what gets me. The first time we tried it? Oh, we did it. Really? Nah. I just can't fathom that. I can't fathom that the first time we tried it, we did it. It seemed like maybe the 60th time we get it right. Because, dude, you're going through all types of like the Van Horn belt or whatever. Um, or the Van, yeah, I think it's a Van Horn. There's so many things you're doing out there. No, it's not the Van Horn belt. What is it? Yeah, the something, I don't know, shit. But it's something like they got that baby belt out there where all these little rocks are coming at you, meteoroids, you know, uh, Megasaurus or whatever. They got all of that shit out there. Milky Way, galaxy, galaxy, everything, you know, side, side angle, whatever. Everything's out there attacking you. We got it. We landed the first time. That's the part that's for me that I don't know. Did I try to drive to Jacksonville one time? Got on the wrong road. The first time I tried to ja drive to Jacksonville. Okay. And, uh, and ended up in, um, about 80 miles north of Tallahassee. So, just saying. And I'm not incompetent. I'm decently competent. I'm probably 80% probably competent. So you telling me we got to the moon first time we tried, landed, got out, people are dancing and stuff like that? Doubtskis, okay? I'm not trying to go full Polish on you, but uh, Doubtskis. Let's take another call here that came in. Here we go. Here we go, Joe. Hey, Theo, this is Joe in Minnesota. Hey, I just want to touch base with you on uh, your comments about the school shootings and AR-15s. And Thanks for calling Joe from Minnesota. I'm looking for a spot to do uh, a couple shows on a Saturday night in Minnesota. If you know of one that seats about, you know, 150 to 200, um, let me know. I'm trying to get that done here in the next couple of weeks and uh, and just put it on the uh, on the schedule for a little bit later in the year. You can just drop me a DM. I, look, I already know the regular comedy clubs I already know. But most of them, they want you there for a full weekend. I'm already there for a Friday night doing some like Gary Vanachuk uh, performance thing. But I want to do my own show there. So just hit the hotline or send me a DM. But uh, onward. If they're to blame or they should be banned or what. Let me start you over, Joe, so I can pay more attention, please. Thanks. Well, this is Joe in Minnesota. Hey, I just want to touch base with you on uh, your comments about the school shootings and AR-15s and Yep. Thank you for uh, calling in about that. More? If they're to blame or they should be banned or whatnot, I think the main reason we get these shootings is because they're on the news and we show the kid's face and we give their name and their whole background. Mm -hmm. we got we got to knock that off right away. That's a great point. We make, you know, we don't make, I don't, I'm not saying we make heroes out of these people, out of these kids that do this. But we certainly, I mean, yeah, we put their faces, we put all this information, we put their, you know, the videos that they, you know, if they made a video before they did it and before they harmed themselves or, or committed suicide, we, that, all that stuff goes out and immediately, without even knowing the effects, what that has long term, and without even knowing, um, you know, if that desensitizes other children at a certain point. But yeah, you're in a, in a world and at a time where uh, social media and digital acclaim and a, having a digital persona is, is everything, or not everything, but it's a lot of things, especially I'm assuming like in high school, you know, a lot of these kids, you know, younger people live on their tablets. I mean, at my age alone, we're already infected enough by it, but, you know, I'm sure that they just see themselves, oh, well, digitally, I'll just be this villain and that'll be my role and I'll be on the news and I'll be, and they'll all be talking about me. And somebody that feels so lonely suddenly knows that they'll, they'll be talked about, that they'll be, that they will be looked at in awe. 
even if it's a negative awe, but they're looked at in awe. And for somebody that feels ne probably never recognized, to then have the opportunity to be looked at in awe, I mean, that's, that's, it's, you know, yeah, we do that. It's, it's probably not helpful. And they, you know, and I'm sure the news, the news does not care. You want to talk about an organ that I don't think has a, has a brain in its brain or in its heart. I think it's some of these news networks. I really do. And you don't have to agree with me on that. And that's okay. And I could be wrong. I really could. Onward. I think you'll see them disappear or hopefully disappear after that happens. I know we could do that. We're a free country where people can report on anything, but I think that has to change. As far as the guns go, you know, you, you can't, I don't think you can blame the guns at all. We're a free country where we can have a lot of dangerous toys and do dangerous things. And, you know, you start taking those things away. You take away the AR-15, you take away the car that can go 155 miles an hour. And you take away the right to go in a liquor store, get a fifth of Jack Daniels and dress up your pit bull like a minion and take him to your sister's <laughs> birthday party. You can do all kinds of stupid shit. And anyway, that's just my two. I appreciate your two there, Joe, from Minnesota. Yeah, it, yeah, I know that's a lot of people's fear. Once you start taking away some things that other things, what else are we not going to be able to do? What else are you not going to be able to do? Um and I had someone send me a DM the other day about, you know, assault rifles and that, you know, they're not the most, most people don't die from those in America and this sort of thing. I get that. But I think as a general idea, if it helps people feel more comfortable, even though it might not actually solve anything, I, uh, then does it, then does it hurt to pass laws that you need more time to get a gun that you, that they don't make guns that, you know, how about, what about some hard rubber bullets? What about rubber cars? People die in car accidents every year. Where's the fucks is the rubber cars? You don't think I'll drive a fucking rubberari? Huh? You don't think I'll, I'll, I'll roll in a convertible? Dude, rubber cars. You'd have full on collisions. You're furious on the interstate at somebody? Have it out. Rubber cars. Dude, I'll imagine putting on a rubber on your yanker and driving a rubber car. Dude, you could drive through the dirtiest ladies or men in town and be fine. You know what I'm saying? You could go four-wheel driving somebody's deep end and be A-OK. -okay. Rubber cars. We need more rubber. And I know we have rubber because we have all these extra trees. Dude, I've been driving. I've been driving past trees before and smelled rubber. So what do you think that is? You telling me that I don't? No, that's rubber, man. Some of these trees have rubber in them. They're hiding it. And we got to get in there. Get in there. And we got to get them. And look, the future is ours, but I'm saying rubber cars, rubber shirts. Imagine giving somebody a hug and bouncing out of it real fast, right back where you are. Sometimes if you hug somebody, you, you know, it takes almost a full second to get back to your, you know, Natural, you know, position one. Imagine getting in, bouncing right back, and you're ready for conversation immediately. That's what I'm talking about. More rubber stuff. We can do it, guys. I know we can. But thank you for calling in with your thoughts there, Joe. Um, let's take another call here. Here we go. This is a uh, call looking for suggestions. We'll get into some of those. Also want to let you know today's episode is brought to you by the Ridge Wallet. The Ridge is a minimalist front pocket wallet. It's an exciting little, little just that, you know, that hard front carry baby bag. Because sometimes you have that thing in your hip and it looks like, oh, he, you know, that man has dysplasia. You know, that man, you know, he probably grew up with wild hips and he doesn't know how to use his legs correctly or he walks sideways. Or, you know, maybe one of his grandparents was a spider. But that's because really it's not anything wrong with that person. It's just they have a rear wallet. So now what you can get is that is the Ridge wallet, and I use one. And at first I wasn't sure about it. By day three, I'm in. Ridge me out. You can get in my Ridge. And the Ridge wallet is a front pocket carry. And you get rid of all the old things you were carrying around your wallet you don't need. You don't need that receipt, dude. Nobody, Honestly, nobody gives a fuck about it. Not even you. 
So you can get rid of all those things. The Ridge Wallet, it's simple. It's minimal. You put it in that front pocket. It's that front pocket carry. Go to ridgewallet.com slash Theo and uh, and get that hitter, man. It's a beautiful deal. You get 10% off right there. Um, now, it's a higher, it's a bit of a luxury item. So recognize that it's not for everybody. And if you can't afford it, don't feel pressured. But it is an item. And uh, you can go to ridgewallet.com slash Theo and get 10% off. All right, let's go into another call here. Happy Memorial Day, everybody. Here we go. What's up, Theo? This is uh, Mike from the 30 Jurors. What's up, Mike? We got a lot of Jersey coming in. Thank you for calling, Mike. Um, I hear you talking about farming and whatnot. Um, I'm working on an organic farm with uh, two other people. Oh, thanks for calling. Yeah, I used to uh, work on corn soaring, uh, cotton, milo. What else do we have? Oh, and bees. We weren't farming bees, but them... Man, they were hoeing my rows a couple times, bruh. I'd definitely been stung out. Onward? Um, a lot of hard work. I mean, from what I've heard, you've been working on a farm, and I love hearing about it. Um, but I was just wondering, what should you do when you know more than your boss? Hmm. Um, kind of gives me shit. Some, not shit, just some stuff doesn't make sense. And I've only been working on this farm for the last few Maybe two months. Okay, thanks for calling, Mike. What should you do when you know more with, more than your boss? Well, at first, I think you should keep it to yourself. You know, and sometimes you can try to show it through your work. Um, and if your boss can't see what you, say if you have a way that you think is better. If you just tell them that, you know, just tell them directly. It's almost like on here. It's like if we just offer advice, then it's, it can be tricky. But if we try and offer a suggestion, like, it's just a safer way to do it. So what I would suggest is that first don't say don't say anything just off the cuff until you have like a real plan. And two, if you think it's a way that you can help them actually business wise and save some money, and if they don't see it at first, whatever your method is or your means, then maybe what you need, you need to alter the way that you're showing it to them. And if you know that they just don't take, you know, just a direct this is how to do it. They're not going to like that. Then you need to just show it to them in a way where maybe you don't tell them at all. Maybe you just show them repeatedly by example and then let them suggest it because they'll still get the same outcome. You'll still get the same outcome too because then they just see, oh, this person knows what they're doing and they know how to take what I want them to do and to do it better. They're still going to know that. They'll know that. But if you say, oh, this is how to do it, then they may hold it against you and they may not, you know, and then they may let you go and then just start doing it your way with somebody else. You know, they just might not be open to that type of criticism. So I think if they're not seeing the better way that you're showing them, and then just try to find a different way to show them. But I would show them instead of tell them. That's what I would try to do. Um, and I think that that could be helpful. And that's just a suggestion, dude. Also, I don't know. But yeah, people don't, we don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear that somebody knows better than us a lot of times. Um, we don't want to hear that. Onward. Hey, Theo, what's going on? It's your boy Cody in South Carolina. Thanks for calling, Cody. Let's hear more. You're always talking about feeling out of place or inadequate. And when I feel inadequate is when I have to take my car to the mechanic. Oh, yeah. That shit can make you really feel just like a tall child. It always feels like I have to take a test when you go in there. Because it's like, hey, ma'am, you know, something's wrong with my car. And they're like, well, what's wrong with it? And I'm like, I don't fucking know because I'm not a mechanic. You know? Like, I don't know shit about mechanics. Like, I'm, I'm a manly dude. I do man shit. You know, I've been to Afghanistan deployment. I got a family. Thanks for your service, bud. Onward. I do things, but I don't know anything about cars. So when I go in there, I feel like this guy's got one up on me, you know, already. And then you never know how much it's going to cost. It's like waiting like some sort of AIDS test for your car. When you go back in there, there it might be $100. It might be fucking $700. Yeah, you don't know. And that's, you know, that and that feels, you feel, or I feel when I, whenever, that, when that happens, I feel like I'm able, someone could really take advantage of me. And that's not a good feeling. So my question is like, if there's any mechanics out there, 
how how should we approach a mechanic? We don't know shit, dude. You know. That's a good question. And look, we had a mechanic that called in earlier. You know, uh, that was Brian. So maybe he'll be able to, uh, if he hears this, he'll be able to send in a call and we'll, we'll put it on next, week, next week's episode to have an answer. But yeah, if you're a consumer with a car and you go to a mechanic, how do you get it right? I mean, here's some things that I could suggest, bro, is that, you know, I, I had a police officer one time was giving me a ticket. Oh, he was actually impounding. They were taking my car in because I hadn't, I had bad plates and I had this and that. And, you know, I hadn't taken care of my responsibilities. And so this gentleman, as he's writing it up, and he said, they're coming to tow it and all this. I said, look, man, I said, I just want you to know, I said, I wouldn't do this to you. That's what I told him. And at first he was being real, you know, he was, I don't know, maybe that crazy day, I don't know, he was, he was really dicking me, dicking me down, bro. You know, proverbially dicking me down, invisibly dicking me down to some visible dicks. John, John, what is that? Oh, invisible cags. But, but then when I, I said to him, I said, look, man, I wouldn't do this to you. I said, I'm having a tough time right now. You know, I don't have any money. I'm over here for a work meeting. I'm trying to get a, a little bit of a leg up. And I know I didn't take care of my responsibilities, but you take this car away, man. You know, I, I need to fly out tonight to the airport. This is just going to put me in a really tough position. And I said, I wouldn't do this to you. And he still took my car away. But when I got to the police station to get it out to impound it, he already had all the paperwork done. And the other officer there said, wow, I don't know what you guys talked about, but um, he never does this. You know, I'm amazed that they have this done. Usually it's a day or something or whatever before they get this paperwork in. And I don't know if that had an effect, but I was just really honest with the guy. And so maybe that's, a, you know, what if you went in there and said, look, you know, I'm a, you know, my budgets are tight. I have two children, you know. Uh, you know, I work off of a, a GI bill, you know, I'm, I'm going through school. I was a service member, whatever. Um, and I don't know anything about mechanicing, you know. Now, if ways that I could help you or if you ask me about this, if you ask me about hand-to-hand -hand combat, you ask me about uh, what weapons should I purchase uh, safely to, to try and protect my family. If you ask me about, um, you know, what's the best way to stay cool in, in the Afghanistan summer. You know, those are things you'd be able to help him with. But just say, hey, you know, these are things I do know. And what I don't know is mechanicking. And I, and, I, and I don't know that I can afford to be just screwed over. So I'm asking you, just man to man, you know, how much does this cost? And just, just know that if you came to me and I was a mechanic and you were a customer, that I would treat you 100% fairly. And if that's true and you would, then he'll, I think he'll feel that. And if you still get an uncomfortable feeling, then trust your gut. Trust that brain in your gut, baby boy. You got that, that you know, that mem belly, that Sarah belly. And I think that's it sometimes. Just lay it out straight. Look, here's who I am. Be vulnerable. Here's who I am. This is my scenario. I don't have a million dollars. I can't, you know, and I don't know about mechanicing. But I need some help here. I just need you to know that this is where I am and I wouldn't take advantage of you. And sometimes when you put it like that to people, it takes it out of that business thing and it puts it into a human thing. And then they feel better instead of making more money, if they have any sort of heart, they feel better about making more esteem for themselves because they're not going to screw you over. They're going to do something esteemable. They're going to do something kind. You know, because esteemable people do esteemable things. Um, but that's just a suggestion, man. But good luck out there. I hate that feeling. But we can't know it all. And sometimes we have to be vulnerable and just assume that the guy's going to treat us well. Um, but good luck, Cody. Thank you for that. Let's take uh, another call here. Hey, Hugh. You. Uh, you can call me Amy. I'm from Saudi Arabia. Okay, Amy from Saudi Arabia, thank you for calling. Uh, I have been dealing with depression and anxiety too for maybe seven, eight months. Wow. Um, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's hectic. I can't imagine, especially in Saudi Arabia where it can be really hot. Uh, you know, anxiety and depression aren't fun, and they're definitely not fun when it's really hot outside. Let's hear more. Probably more, I don't know. But I can visit or see a therapist here because, you know, uh, they're very expensive. And from what I've heard, they are very bad. 
But okay, so she can't see or hear a therapist there because they um, are very expensive and from what she's heard, very bad. More? But honestly, I don't know why I'm making this call, but maybe you can give me an advice or something that will make this more bearable because I I had suicidal thoughts for, for, for quite a while now. And I still question why why would someone keep on going when life is pretty shit and yeah it can be very bad here. I mean it's Saudi Arabia so that explains a lot. It's not a friendly country for women especially. Not for everyone, to be honest. And I just wanna say be good to yourself, to you. Hmm. I really appreciate everything you do. Uh, and you're very awesome and uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, Amy or Annie. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that part uh, for calling. You know what's funny is you're saying this in this call. I'm thinking like, well, what if this was my mother calling? You know, what if that was my mother or my sister? You know, calling a phone number in another country to share how they felt. And it makes me, you know, I, it makes me feel well. I love you. You know, you so don't feel alone. I don't want you to feel that. I can imagine, I, you know, when you said it's very tough there in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I mean, you know, we always hear that in the news. I mean, I've been to Saudi Arabia before and seen, you know, the men walk and have like three or four women like dressed up walking behind them. And it's, you know, it has a very, what appeared to me. And that, look, I was just there in the airport, I think twice. Um, to have like a very like subservient type of vibe. Um, I can imagine that, that, yeah, where do you, we, you know, we don't even think about that. Where do you get mental health help in a place like that? Um, well, for one, you're reaching out to others. So that's really positive and you have a beautiful voice and you're not alone. You know, we have, uh, we have a lot of mental health problems here in America. So we have that in common. Um, you know, you know, I don't really know how to help cure your depression. I do know a couple things that um, taking a, a different contrary action can help. So if you get up in the morning and you lay there for an extra half hour and you don't feel good, then, then you know that's going to happen. If that happens every day, you know that's going to happen. So you have to do something contrary to that. You have to get up right out of bed, even though you don't want to, and take a walk. Or listen to a song that you like, or stretch, or smile, or sometimes I started doing this new thing where I think about, I think about something silly or stupid that I do. You know, I think about something silly or stupid that I do personally, and I laugh at myself, and that puts me in a lot of different perspective when I can do that, when I can laugh at myself at the beginning of the day, because then I'm not taking myself so seriously. You can, you have to take, but you, I, I, you know, one thing that helps me is taking contrary action. You know, I, I know I don't want to go to, to the gym or to yoga, and so I do it anyway. Because if I do it anyway, then I start to train myself to do something different than the previous actions which have led me all to the same spot, to be caught up in my anxiety and caught up in my depression. Because depression will tell you to not do anything. That's one of depression's main weapons. Oh, don't, don't do anything. You feel bad. You know, feelings aren't facts. Feelings are not facts. And you can, if you, take a, if you take a contrary action, you take an action, your feelings will follow. There's no way you can go for a walk and not feel a little better than whenever you started the walk. There's no way. That's fact. That's a walk fact. That's a walk fact fact dub f's so you know those are some things but the cool thing is that i'm just now remembering is we have a guy named christopher ryan coming in who wrote a book called sex at dawn he's a psychologist so he knows more than me in this area for sure i mean i've certainly been a victim of anxiety and depression i certainly know that that shit grows on itself like a moss and if you stay indoors and you don't get outdoors and you don't get in the sunlight and you don't let the higher powers of the world see you and see that you're a good person and you stay caught up and you stay cloaked inside, you know, and you stay inside of your bubble of nothing can change, 
then it then then it's a petri dish for depression and anxiety and that stuff just grows on itself until it's just a dark vine and it's living on the side of your face and it's one of its tongs of one of its you know tentacles is just gone into your ear and every time your brain wants to have a good idea it just chokes it out chokes it out a little bit so you have to take some contrary actions, or that's something that's helped me. So that's something that's just an idea. But we're get, I'll ask him. I'll play this call for him, and I'll ask him when he's in here, so we can get you a little bit of actual somebody who's certified with a little bit more education, a lot more education. And uh, and I hear that he's a really great soul as well. He's been on Joe Rogan's podcast, um, and um, he's a best he's he's a best friend of one of my best friends. Uh, so we'll play that for him. Amy or Annie, I couldn't hear your name, but um, just know that you're not alone and people love you. You know, you, I don't know if you know that, but I never thought in my life about how many women might be suffering with mental health disorders in Saudi Arabia. And you just opened my eyes up to that. So I'm a little, I'm a little upset by that because now that's something that I have to think about, but I'm also grateful because... You know, once we start to get better from some of our ailments, I feel like we have a responsibility to try and help others get better. You know? But uh, keep your head up. All right, young lady? Um, go for a walk and just know that we're thinking about you. We're talking about you right now. Isn't that that's cool, right? It's cool. All right, be good. Uh, let's hear another question here. Hey, Theo. I'm a student. I'm starting school on the 4th of June. There's just so much going on and so much changing in the world. And I'm just always, I always feel like I just, I always feel like things could be better, I guess. I just feel like I could be, I could always feel better. I could always be better, 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 you know. And it's just like, man, it's like, fuck. Mm. I don't even know, man. All right. I love you, man. Bye. Thanks for calling. That's exhausting, isn't it? It's exhausting feeling like things can always be better. Things can always feel better. Better, better, better. Yeah. Wow. As you say that, man, I can relate to that so much. You know, I spent, and I still spend half of my day thinking about that. You know, instead of just being grateful for what where I am. You know, and being grateful that things are better. Things are better. Things are better than when I used to stand around just put pressing my hands against my hips thinking I had them in my pockets. You know, things are better. You know, now when I'm able to like, um, I'm able to sit here and think about uh, with other people about their issues instead of just being stuck in my own. You know, things are better. You know, things are better when, you know, I'm able to go home and, uh, and, you know, be upset by something that, you know, my mother didn't do on purpose, that it's just inadvertent. But it reminded me of all these feelings of how, like, um, my mother was never available to me. But now I know that, that that time is over. And she doesn't feel it that way. She doesn't know it that way. You know, all she knows is that she loves me now and that and that she's always loved me. And so whatever pain or whatever I have from previous, there's nothing I can. So all I can do now is just be patient and just, just, you know, just let her know that I care no matter what and try not to, and you don't start a new grudge. And that's better than I used to be. You know, it's, it's wild, man. Cause you do get better. And you know, one thing that does help me, and this is something that I do every day, is make a gratitude list. When I wake up in the morning, I make a gratitude list. And I list 10 things that I'm grateful for. And then I list a reason why with each one. You know, I'm grateful for my hair. Why? Because it keeps my head warm and my neck warm now at this point. Or I'm grateful for my sister because she never gives up and she tries so hard. And, uh, you know, or I'm grateful for, I'm grateful for uh, my mother, my mother, because she's still alive. 
You know, I'm grateful for uh, my friend Bo because I went home this weekend and um, he let me borrow his truck so that I, because I didn't have my driver's license, I couldn't get a rental car. And he made my weekend so much easier where he gave me the opportunity I could go see my nieces and, and, and it was a gift. You know, I'm grateful. There's just, and you know what it does though? It takes it. So now I'm not thinking about me and I'm not thinking about what could be better. I'm thinking about what is good. And so for me, that works, man. I'm not trying to be a know-it-all or anything. I'm just telling you that, that works. I still have a ton of moments where I think things could be better. But also some of that came from when I was young. You know, some something was, somebody around me, nothing was ever good enough for them. And so then that builds in me that, oh, things always have to be better. But man, I bet you're doing okay. You know, if you look, try and look at the facts, you know, try and look at the facts. Are you doing okay? Because it may be that thing that to be better, but that could just be a feeling. You know, and feelings aren't facts. I think feelings are way important. You know, I'd rather know how I feel sometimes than what I think. But feelings aren't facts, man. And if if you get always getting that feeling, then you could, you know, maybe find some ways. And for me, a gratitude list helps because then I quit thinking about, you know, what I don't have and what could be better. And I think about what I do have. And that puts me in a place of uh, gratitude for me. And I also might not know what the fuck I'm talking about. Let's take one last call here, and then we're going to shut it down for today, man. I appreciate all you guys calling. Appreciate everything. 985-664-9503 is the hotline. Uh, Theovon.com slash store. We got a bunch of dope merch in there and cool stuff. If you want to support the podcast or support anything, uh, Theovon.com slash Patreon. Um, that's where we have funds where we can do outreach and do some other neat stuff. We're going to do some stuff for these single moms. If there's a date we have coming up on the calendar um, where we're going to be in your area and there's a, a cool single mother that you know that you think could use a night out. And I don't want some lady, you know, if she got 40 year old children or 35, I want a mom, I want somebody that's, you know, still in the trenches. That's got them, you know, chirping mouths, you know. That's got a 12 year old on an eight year old, you know, or, you know, what I'm, and I, I'm not trying to ice anybody out of the opportunity, but, you know, I ain't trying to take, you know, Grandma Girdle and her two shorties out to the, to the ice, to, to the comedy show. You know, when she got a 50 year old son and he ain't getting his shit together, that's, that's on him. You know, we're just trying to get a little bit of relief, a nice evening for a, for um, a lady or two. But you can submit them through the website. Um, Theovon.com slash podcast or podcasts. It's all on the website. Uh, let's take this call. Here we go. Thank you for calling. Hey, what's up, Theo? Uh, Andy in Portland, Oregon. Hey, Andy in Portland. And you know what? You know, I met a hamster rancher up there and we went and visited him. And um, man, that was awesome. Man, I went and saw this man had about five, 6,000 hamps. And we had them beautiful critters and everybody was just. Mm, man, beautiful to see all those magical little just nuggets of the Lord. Just those furry living electrons, just some of them fucking and peep, some, a lot of them just sleeping and resting and everything. To watch them just set it off. Let's hear more. I uh, just wanted to say what's up. I know things are going to be blowing up for you soon. I just wanted to send you... A uh, friendly reminder as you're on the precipice of success, just uh, remember who you are, brother. That's why people love you. Don't get tempted by the dark arts. Don't fall into traps. Just keep being you. Don't sell out, my man. Much love. I love you. And not in a homosexual way. Mm -hmm. I just love what you're doing with your life. And No, I understand that part. Onward your life and the way you're staying true and uh the podcast and your comedy man all right later thanks andy for the message man i appreciate it i really do and you know i uh you know i thought about that actually a lot in the past two weeks like you know there has been a lot there has been an uptick in like support people reaching out you know, I notice it at the shows, you know, at the, even at the comedy store, like people wanting to hang out at, you know, take pictures and things like that. And, you know, I worry a lot about ego. You know, I worry about it because uh, it's dangerous. My ego is so dangerous. Isn't it? It's almost remarkable. There's something inside of us that is just so, obs that can be, that, that, uh, that, that, that's the dark arts. 
It's so upset. It's so, I mean, it's so mystical. That's a shape shifter. And that thing is just wiggling and in and out of your in and out of your brain stem, just you know, just circling your your ser- your uh just circling your brain stem, just waiting. Just waiting to, to speak up. And it's scary, man. I think about it sometimes. I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, I mean, I do want to, you know, I do want to achieve my goals. Um, but at the same time, I do feel like I want to, you know, I want to, you know, I don't want to be self-centered. You know, I've spent so, you know, because the worst part about, I've spent a lot of my life being self-centered. Um, even though some people might not say that, to me, it felt that way because I just had to care about myself. You know, when you're growing up and you feel like you don't have anybody then you become self-centered almost as a mechanism to take care of yourself. You know, you have to be so aware of everything. You have to be on guard all the time. You have to be thinking, how do I get what I need? Because it just started at such an age where you, that's all, it just, it's, you had to use it to survive. It was like learning to drink water. You had to have that skill. You had to have that, you know, that me, 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 me. Because if nobody else cared about you or that's how you saw it, then you had to care about yourself. Because if you didn't care about you, then there would be no one who did. And so, you know, but I know as I've gotten older that I can shed that skin and that that doesn't serve me the same anymore. But I, but it's remarkable. The ego is so powerful, you know, and it's tricky and it's cunning and it's baffling and it's powerful. And that's copywritten, I know, but you know, it is. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to. But I appreciate that reminder. And if I seem out of line, man, check me. Because I'm happy to be checked. You know, I don't want to. I want to do, uh, you know, I want to do good things. I want to, I want to, I want to achieve my goals, but I want to do good things too. You know, I don't want to leave the earth when I get out of here and just you know, not have like a lot of love in my life, you know, and just a lot of joy. Um, Because in the end, especially as I get older, being selfish, just it starts to hurt a lot. It it hurts. I think it hurts because all you have at some points when you're so selfish, all you really have and that you know it is you. And that's just lonely. It's just lonely. But I appreciate you checking me, man. And you can do it again if you feel that way, Andy. Uh, You'll be the uh, ego lifeguard if that's okay with you. But, you know, and I know I'm not the only one out there that thinks this way about our egos and how dangerous it can be. I worry about it. I worry about it. But I appreciate you, uh, you know, let me know I'm not alone in thinking about it. And thanks for the kind words, man. You know, I don't know what the, you know, what the future has in store for me career wise, but man, this, uh, this year has been great. And, and we're, and being a part of this podcast has been great. I mean, dude, I, I never thought this podcast would be up like this. Dude, this thing, look at the front. I mean, we were balancing, I was balancing that camera on fucking shoe boxes. Yeah. I mean, it was, so it's just been a joy. And we're going to do some cool stuff and we're going to do it together. And I appreciate you guys being here with me. All right, I'm going to take us out here uh, on this Memorial Day. Happy Memorial Day to everyone. Thank you for everybody that hit the hotline. Thank you for everybody that's being supportive. Um, if you have any suggestions, constructive criticisms, you can always hit us up anywhere. You know, this is a team effort. We do this. And uh, some weeks these episodes will be what you want and some weeks these episodes will be not what you want. But that's life. So stick around. And uh, let's make this thing, let's, let's keep this thing alive together. Happy Memorial Day.